a lot of people don't realize what's really going on. They view life as a bunch of unconnected incidents and things. They don't realize that there's this, like, lattice of coincidence that lays on top of everything. I'll give you an example. I'll show you what I mean. Suppose you're thinking about a plate of shrimp. Suddenly somebody will say, like, plate or shrimp or plate of shrimp out of the blue. No explanation. No point in looking for one either. It's all part of cosmic unconsciousness. You need a lot of acid, Miller, back in the hippie days. I'll give you another instance. You know the way everybody's into weirdness right now? Books and all the supermarkets about Bermuda Triangles, UFOs, how the Mayans invented television, that kind of thing. I'm not to read them books. Well, the way I see it, it's exactly the same. There ain't no difference between a flying saucer and a time machine. People get so hung up on specifics, they miss out on seeing the whole thing. You are listening to Dark Notes Podcast. I'm Lisa, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Shane. Hello. <laughs> uh, today's episode is called... Supernatural Sex. And a little disclaimer. This episode contains bedroom invaders, attacks, and other not always pleasurable accounts. So, if you are sensitive to that, skip this episode. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about the Love and Saucers documentary mm-hmm. about David Huggins. Um, he's a man who's had a lifetime of very bizarre paranormal experiences yes with grays um bigfoot or mm-hmm. <laughs> little little hairy bean yeah, yeah. the little what do you call it the hairy guy or the little guy a little hairy bean yeah <laughs> with yellow eyes i love that. yes, yes. <laughs> So the documentary starts out and it it's one of those I knew I was going to love it in the first 5 minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he lives he's 72 at the time of the filming. Um mm-hmm. lives in a small apartment in Hoboken, New Jersey and right. immediately you see his massive VHS collection of sci-fi <laughs> and horror. And this, yeah. A John Lilly book in the laying on the coffee table or something. So I didn't right. like this guy right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, a neat, nice guy. Um, mm-hmm, seems like. awesome. Yeah. Um, works part time at a deli as an artist, has really good artwork um, about his experiences. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we'll just get into it. He was, it was, it was great. I loved it. Um, I did too. Cool. <laughs> so, um, David Huggins grew up in the South. I think, what did we just, was it Alabama? Oh my God. <laughs> we still forgot. We keep saying yeah. we have to go back to find out. Yeah. All right. He grew up in the South. Somewhere right. <laughs> in the deep South. Yeah, I remember that. And Far land. Georgia. Georgia. I wrote it down. Yeah. yeah. All right. So his first encounter was at eight years old. He's in the woods by his house. Mm-hmm. And he. Which is normal, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> right. I, I spent my whole childhood in the woods. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, he comes across a Bigfoot with yellow eyes that telepathically speaks, speaks to him, to him. Uh-huh. calls him by name. 
and um, not too long, not too much later, he um, was by the barn Mm -hmm. um, at his house and sees a giant praying mantis type. That's fucking scary. (laughs) I know. And it sprays him with liquid. Right. And then he passes out. And I, it, from what I remember, I think most of these encounters ends with him passing out. They do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If not all of them, maybe not all of them, but mo- a lot of them. Right. So, um, yeah, that, <laughs> what do you think out of all the beings, that's got to be the scariest, right? Uh, that, yeah. Yeah. I- I think real praying mantis. Is scary. It, yeah, I do too. <laughs> it, it would. I would like. I would like the giant praying mantis to be my friend and right. You know, but it would. I could still probably never look him in the eyes. Like, I'd have to look away. <laughs> but um. So yeah, then another time he's um in a field by his house and he sees these six what's known as the gray aliens peeking out at him and um he faints and Mm -hmm. wakes up and they're all standing around him and he faints again um throughout his life they keep visiting him these Mm -hmm. um little guys well um he said they wore blue jumpsuits but they're the typical gray. classic gray alien you know the right and eyes. and he expressed that they they didn't seem hostile right totally yeah. and uh um they even uh he said that he went in their crafts and i think he said there were different types of crafts mm-hmm um, but that he was allowed on them several times and um, uh, that they seemed to go somewhere, but he had no idea where, you know, right. Um, right. That w- one, of, one of the things that makes you like this guy so much is that he, it's just, it's just matter of fact. He's like, look, this is what happens. I, I can't, right. I have no fucking idea what, what <laughs> right. it is what what they are where we went you know it, it, i'm telling you what happened to me <laughs> right right and, and um um you, you know it, it it's such a um uh i don't know it just made me like the guy better <laughs> um, i know what you mean it seems real he's real like, yeah, I'm yeah. Just, I'm just, just telling you what I experience. Right, and and I'm not saying I don't know anything or have all the answers. Right, but here's what happened. Absolutely, and that attitude um, uh, makes me feel that he's mentally healthy. Right, right. you know um, that he's um, uh, not trying to piece together a belief system out of or make money or yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and um and his artwork yeah. is really really interesting. It is. And I love good. it. I'm How still tra- I'm still trying to pick out a piece. I want Which... to <laughs> I I think I got to go with the the yellow eye Bigfoot. That's just too amazing. Yeah. Um what what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Um well, we're about to talk about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> cool. I thought okay, that was 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 well um represented i thought he did you know i like the painting or the picture the painting yeah did. one of these gray aliens who was i think a little taller than the rest mm-hmm. i think so named, too yeah a female gray alien named crescent takes his virginity um, yes by i think it was by the field in the field by his house. Yes. And um, she mounts him and rides him until he climaxes and he looks in her eyes and passes out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and he 
Yeah, in the documentary, he looks on, back on that as a fond memory. <laughs> yes, and not only that, it turned into like a relationship. Yeah, she, he, he keeps, at 19, he uh, leaves home to go to art school in New York City, and these visitations keep happening in his apartment in New York City. And I think even out in the city sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And he, he said he knew when they were coming, everything would get quiet, even a busy city street. You know? Yes. Which is very odd. Very, very weird. Very odd. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the guy, I, I mean, the, the besides coming away believing him that some that this guy definitely went through and ex these experiences um i come away liking the guy mm, me too you know, he's got a he's got a adult son now who seems seems to love his dad seems to uh uh um, right respect him not think of him as a kook and, and nobody in the documentary does his neighbors love him his employer loves him it's just uh he's he has uh, odd experiences right? yeah he's just this guy that something oh. happened and uh um yeah i love the documentary i love me it. too yeah highly me recommend too. it and and it's on what amazon prime and youtube i think it's yeah. on youtube yeah it's yeah. on youtube um is it, I think it's for free. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Check it out on YouTube. It's great. All right. And then we looked up some other sexual encounters with beings from UFOs, right? Yes. And we used um, Brad Steiger books for that. Yeah. Otherworldly Affairs and... Real Encounters, Different Dimensions, and Otherworldly Beings. Dear Mr. Steiger, a typical letter begins. I am not a nut. I am on the dean's list at Blank College, majoring in physics. This is my real name, and if you are suspicious of me, you can check me out. Last summer, I saw a flying saucer at close range. It hovered over my car for several miles as I drove to my parents' farmhouse. It was definitely a metallic object. Shortly after that sighting, I was aware of something in my bedroom one night as I was preparing for bed. I could see nothing, but I could not shake a feeling of uneasiness. I was... Not yet asleep when I felt a pressure on the bed beside me. When I sat up, I saw nothing, but I felt something fondling my breast. I wanted to scream to get out of bed, but I was unable to move. I remember nothing more until I awakened the next morning, but I have a reason to believe that something made love to me while I slept. I believe this incident was associated in some way with my sighting of the UFO. Do you want to go next? I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is also from that Steiger book. The newer one. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Last year, this author received a letter from a UFO percipient that related another example of the clinical interest certain flying saucer occupants have in the sex act of homo mm -hmm. sapiens. Don't think I'm some kind of nut. The letter begins in a familiar plea. I never did believe in UFOs, but here is my experience. I will not reveal my name, but I live in Las Vegas. My hobby is women. And since I am married, I must be very careful mm -hmm. on July 2nd. 1968 a girl and i were parked on a very lonely desert road we had a blanket on the ground and were very busy in a certain act when a very very hot wave fell on us i looked up to see two men 
both about five feet, six inches tall, standing beside us in a soft light. They had on some kind of coveralls that looked like diver suits. Their faces didn't look strange, but they had no hair on their heads. They spoke a language I couldn't understand. Behind them, hovering about 20 feet, 20 feet off the ground, was a craft that had a circle of small lights around its middle. The two men raised us up by our arms, and they fell all over our naked bodies. They pushed the backs of our knees and made us kneel, and one of them cut off some of my girl's hair and put it in a container and pointed toward the sky. Then they walked beneath the ship, stood in the circle of a spotlight, and they were gone. The UFO disappeared from sight in 10 seconds. That's fucking terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> All right. In UFO Warning, New Zealand author John Stewart told of a sexual assault on his pretty young research assistant, which came after the two of them had seen a grotesque, misshapen entity while investigating a UFO report. Stewart stated that he felt the young woman should have stayed with him and his wife, but she had insisted that she would be all right in her own home. Barbara, the young woman, had been incorrect. She immediately noticed a peculiar odor the moment she stepped into her room. She undressed, bathed, but could not free her mind of the impression that unseen eyes followed her every move. Then, as she crushed out a cigarette and turned to put on her pajamas, an invisible something touched her on the shoulder. She found herself unable to move. The horror had begun. For two and a half hours, an unseen entity had its way with her body. Oh, wow. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I concluded, I'm sorry. Um, I concluded that the thing had been solid, even if invisible. Barbara told Stuart later, there was, of course, no way of knowing exactly what it was like. And I tried to form a picture in my mind to fit it, but I gave up in fear. I got into bed and eventually fell into a deep sleep filled with nightmares. With the light of day, I again looked at my body and shuddered when I saw the scratches. It had really happened after all. Barbara's flesh had been left covered with scratches from its contact with the rough-skinned space-age incubus. I thought that one was well. Wow. That's really good, yeah. Um, in November 2010, we received an intriguing, detailed account of the UFO abduction encounters of Pete Peterson, a mental health pet Was that weird? Did you hear oh. A mental health technician at an inpatient psychiatric hospital in Oklahoma. Uh, and this is a really detailed account, but we're going to the sexual portion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it's really good if, if you look it <laughs> up. Um, Z. Peterson warned us that some of his abduction experience was sexually explicit and graphic. He said that he had debated if he could find the words to abbreviate the additional formation or else leave it out altogether. In the end, he decided not to sacrifice the more functional elements of his disclosure for some small measure of personal modesty. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is the person telling the story. As I studied their bodies, I stood in front of them and knelt occasionally to see them more clearly. They had a, a rather large organ that looked very much like a huge prehensile salmon orange tongue curling and extending out from beneath folds of skin. Oh my God. Not unlike the human female's vulva. This tongue was approximately 10 inches long and four inches wide at its thickest point and appeared to consist of a very dense muscular tissue. 
the bean explained that it was much like a clitoris or prostate on humans. It actually curled around my forearm when I touched it. It was covered in small, smooth, shiny round nodules all over its dorsal surface. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. Crazy, right? This is like insane. All this time, I felt both nervous and curious. At a moment, I felt almost ashamed because it aroused me, actually. It aroused me mentally and physically because it was so fascinating to me. The being again sent me a wave of calm and told me nothing we are doing here is wrong. You need not feel ashamed or bad inside. This is about learning and growing. Wow. <laughs> right? Yeah. This is like, they're cool, right? <laughs> um, I was still fear feeling very odd about this, but my curiosity was far too strong to back away again. As I looked back down, I could see what appeared to be a rather large male organ protruding from the genital folds. It looked very similar to a human penis, except that it had a slightly different shape. It was jet black and shiny, smooth, <laughs> <laughs> and about the size of my entire forearm. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is now is this <laughs> sorry to interrupt? Uh huh. Is this a woman? It's a this man. Is happening to? Oh, okay. It's a man. And what I didn't, I should have said, um, the beans are aquatic. They're in a pool. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, he's approached them and, and is checking them out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, penis. That's where I'm at. Where are you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, jet black and shiny, smooth and about the size of my form. Okay. Below the tongue-like organ was a slit that appeared analogous to a human female's vagina. Almost identical to humans, it had a rectum just after a small bump on what appeared to be a perineum-like region of their anatomy. They explained that their species had always been this way, their sex, as they put it, um, undifferentiated. Thus, their bodies had both male and female qualities. They could become pregnant and impregnate one another. Oh, wow. They formed mated pairs like humans do, and the idea of sex was seen as something both sacred and spiritual. They made love face-to-face, belly-to-belly in the water, and they interpenetrated one another simultaneously all of this was transmitted instantly through their skin into mine. We were very close now and our legs touched. The beans made their intention clear to me. They wanted to touch me too, but they wanted to make sure that I was absolutely clear that this was not a sexual act, but a mental, spiritual, and emotional one that just happened to have physical components. I felt one of them reach their hand down and come to rest with the smooth, warm pads of their fingers now directly on my perineum, known as the root chakra, or the root gate of the chakra. At this point, I felt information being read from my body, from my chakra, and essentially from all the cells of my body. They told me that they knew my entire life, every cell in my body, and even my entire family. They also explained that this process required a great deal of openness, and I felt another huge wave in, of induced calm pass through my entire body, pushing me nearly to the point of sleep. They explained that this act would allow for direct communication from their chakra system into and through my own. They had me place my hand in the same place on their body, and hold it there. I began to feel a sensation very much like an orgasm building in my genitals and continuing to move through my spine until my entire body felt like I was going to have a massive orgasm. Oh, wow. Every cell in my body filled with indescribable ecstasy. I did not have an orgasm, but the sensation continued to build to a very uncomfortable level, and I could feel my body beginning to shake and shudder in waves of tremendous energy. 
The being continued to send waves of calm into me through my chakra. By this time, my eyes had rolled backward into my head and I was convulsing. As the feeling built and built many times over, I felt suddenly like I was going to leave my body altogether, like I might simply fall out of my own body into the blue sky above me. Then I lost all comprehension of my body altogether. It was as if I was no longer myself, but a combination of the being and myself, just thoughts and feelings pulsing back and forth, a dynamic communication with consciousness. I had no contact with my bodily senses and the very concept of time seemed to not apply to this experience. As we hung there feeling suspended in a great void of light and energy, I felt great volumes of information being fed into my spirit chakra from the being. In fact, the information was being sent back and forth freely, like waves of energy and light. Gradually, I began to perceive a feeling of instability within my portion of the link. And I then felt my body again being overcome with the tidal waves of energy. It felt as if my body was being dragged behind the wake of a huge, fast-moving ship, like the energy might literally tear me apart, even onto an atomic level. My body could no longer withstand all the energy, and I was beginning to overload. I felt as if physical death was imminent. What a horrible feeling that is. The being knew it, and in an instant, I was let go. I can recall a violent flash of blinding light and an indescribable sound, feeling, something like a horrible snap. As I was slammed back into my bed, I awoke shaking and crying, dizzy, and completely overwhelmed with emotion, naked and covered in sweat. That was an intense one. That was like crazy. That's heavy. They, I, I really like that one. Um, honestly, it sounds so much of that sounded like a really good MDMA trip. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. like when you'd get the pure, the good pure shit, but with minus the aquatic in the, entity part. I never, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but. Um. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a really good one. And again, if you read the whole thing, not just the sexual or touching part. Yeah. I think the beans are from Sirius. Yeah. 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 The um. That seems to come up a lot. <laughs> the, yeah. Um. Yeah. The the first. The first thing I ever read about the serious connection was uh, Cosmic Trigger mm-hmm. by Robert Anton Wilson. And he spent about a three month period where he thought he was telepathically communicating with beings from Sirius. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he started the, the, um, it was an experiment. And what he did to kick it off was, uh, you know, Sirius is closest to the earth. I think it's, they call it the dog days. It starts on like July 23rd. Right. And so on July 23rd, he dropped acid and did performed a Crowley ritual. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he said, that's what kicked it off for like three months. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, uh, anyway, sorry. No, 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 no. This is what we do. (laughs) This is what we're supposed to do. Um, But so there's a lot of information that came through that three month period. That's yeah, yeah. And um, um, and there was a trickster aspect too. He said um that Uh he, he would be in crowds, like walking down the street in Berkeley, and um, 
he would hear a voice in his head that said, see that guy to the left, that guy's name is James. And he'd go up to the guy and be like, Hey, is your name James? He'd be like, yeah, how'd you know? Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so he did stuff like that constantly. Yeah. And then yeah. it's kind of like, do I like this? Not like this. Yeah. This yeah. And, yeah. And it slowly, I guess just faded away. But, um, uh, it, it, one of the reasons, um, I was so fascinated with Robert Anton Wilson was he had that um, in all of his works, the um, he would, even in the introduction, he would be like, I'm not saying I know what this is. I'm trying to not <laughs> form a belief system about it. I'm just reporting what, you know, <laughs> reporting what happened. Yeah. Right. And what uh, I experienced. Right. Right. And he, he, um, Along with Brad Steiger, um, mm -hmm. would warn against um, people kind of uh, willy nilly getting involved in the occult, right? Um, without um, having a heavy degree of self discipline and good mental health <laughs> right right yes. yeah yeah i think um um i even emailed brad steiger one time and uh years ago before he died and um because wilson had quoted him in cosmic trigger saying that that steiger said that right. the, i think the quote the brad steiger quote was the mental institutions are filled with people who uh, weren't ready for dabbling right. in the occult. And I, um, so I emailed Steiger and, and asked him, I said, here's this quote I read. I said, could you, uh, um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? He's like, dude, every book I've written testifies to that fact. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I think I think he wrote I think he wrote like 190 books. Yeah, very important piece. Yeah, interesting thing to remember. And so we looked at this, and then we, um, I mean, probably the first movie to come to anyone's mind when we're talking about bedroom invaders. The entity. Yeah. So we had to. <laughs> You know, we had to go there next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Barbara Hershey. I do too. I think she is fantastic yeah, I in love her almost everything I've seen her in. Same. Yeah. But I am so fucking bored with that movie. I knew you are! <laughs> <laughs> I, re I, you know, I had, I've <laughs> had fond memories of it. I, was, well, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, the entity. Yeah. 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 It was a powerful movie the first time I, I watched it, which was years ago. And, and um, it, the, the first thing I remember is the soundtrack. It just so mm -hmm. intense. Mm -hmm. And um, but there's beautiful parts, too. But during the attacks, there's a certain uh, score played that is just terrifying yeah. yes <laughs> it's uncomfortable it's, right it, is. it, it bring it's it's kind of like the uh score in the exorcist it causes anxiety this yeah is very very uh uncomfortable and uh powerful but um so it did work well the music and then her just doing the body missions there's no other actor like attacking her it, oh yeah, yeah. exactly and, right and, it's yeah, that uncomfortable so, music and then her just acting that out and yeah it's like uh like powerful. yeah yeah powerful and it's you, you're the um yeah the feeling watching it is just oh my god you feel so bad for this woman and and uh, but <laughs> you, you know, you don't even realize. Oh, there's nobody else there, right? You know, right. This, you're, like, you're hey, totally lady, there's convinced. no one there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're totally right. convinced, right? And uh, but uh, you did watch it a few times to get ready for the episode. So yeah, you are done. And, and, you're officially I done. I, I don't right. know. I'm not. I'm really. <laughs> think it's. I think it's a good movie. It's just. 
right. um uh it's a slow burn it really mm-hmm. is and uh um but um yeah so i'm kind of like half and half on it i don't want to watch it again but it's for a long time yeah <laughs> yeah for a long time but it, it was it was great to watch it again and to watch the new blu-ray mm-hmm. of it um yeah uh i'd highly and, recommend it and yeah. do we just want to do like a brief what the movie's about just in case they haven't heard i didn't yeah. want to go into her too much and i think we both agreed on that just because it's so overdone her case yeah um yeah but it's I, based on a true story yes right right i don't have any of the details do you have the oh, details? it's a single mother yeah oh, i wish i would have wrote down it took place in california yeah um it's a single welfare mom and with three children yeah two girls and a boy the boy's the oldest yeah and basically she just starts getting attacked in her bedroom it starts in her bedroom um i do know that in the movie she wore and i i think i asked you about this because i didn't watch i read the book she wore a regular robe but in the book it's a red robe and in the movie it's a blue silk yeah, they that changed that up road. a little bit. In the yeah. book, it's red. Yeah. And um, and in the book, she has this um, elaborate, ornate bed. Like this huge bed with angels. Oh, wow. That that was already there when she moved in. Yeah. Which is just an interesting little part. And I don't think that's in the movie. I don't. No, they but... never. Yeah. I and so it would have just been overload to throw that into. I don't know. Yeah, and we'll go yes. through this quickly. Just, I'm um, sorry. You know, oh no, yeah. it's fine. It's fine. I love okay. it. Okay. And then, um, so she gets attacked, raped by something she can't see. Raped. Yeah. Oh shit! I'm sorry, and I'll cut that out. I wanted you to read the police report because the boyfriend. There's the police report. That the book starts out with that does the movie doesn't does it i can well yeah. there's a, a scene a, that kind of mentions it with fucking mo green right 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 yeah and, and uh, <laughs> he um there it isn't it like isn't a, a police report but the doctor her um her mm-hmm. doctor who ends up caring about her deeply and um trying to um kind of steer her away from the paranormal part of it and right. uh, trying to convince her that this is mental illness on her part you know right, and, right, right. um uh he is speaking with i'm gonna call him mo green because he was mo green in the <laughs> Father, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um he's speaking with Mo Green after the incident that okay that he witnessed and um where the entity rapes her in front of him and right. tries to intervene the entity pushes him back and and uh assaults him the um but the if I'm not mistaken the scene in the movie is that Mo Green explains what happens to the doctor in the police station and okay. he, and the doctor, you know, he tells the doctor, "Look, there was somebody there. This wasn't her uh, uh, sexual repression, right? Repression yes, that's that's what the police report is. Yep, yep. Yeah, this was an entity, an invisible entity there that pushed me away. This is what happened, you know. Right. At first, I thought I heard her yeah. moaning, whatever. I thought whatever, yeah. whatever, and then, but it was so." Um, realistic looking, even though I couldn't see anybody. Yeah. Oh wow, I need to read that. But yeah, that's the um, that he I, smashed. I, that he smashed it with a chair or something. But of course, it ends yeah, up hitting her. <laughs> that was in the movie. Yeah, that right. was okay. That was okay, good. In the movie, and um, um, yeah, that's a good point because that's one of the best um 
themes of the movie is that this um the movie starts out she's totally alone and even um her teenage son doesn't believe this right, is invincible. everyone everyone yeah. her best friend her teenage son her doctor everyone even the paranormal investigators at first don't believe right. her they you know and slowly everybody in the movie is convinced because they get to witness it. <laughs> so right. That's a very powerful piece of the movie. And, yes, it uh, is. Yeah. Um, and uh, then just from the book a little bit, um, yeah. I did not watch the movie again. If it, if they haven't figured that out, <laughs> because, it, because <laughs> I couldn't find it online. Yeah. But, it is um, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I thought, yeah. I thought it would be easy. Yeah. Um, but in the book, it does, like, she gets attacked um, a couple times, ends up at her girlfriend Cindy's yes. um, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Cindy, you know, lets her and the kids in. But then, you know, when they're sitting up after the kids are settled, like, you know, what's going on? Why are you here in the middle of the night? You know, you got to tell them something, you know. What's going yeah. On? Uh, <clears throat> she explains she ends up explaining to her that, um, or she wouldn't tell her. At first, she doesn't tell her the first night. And then the next day, um, Cindy's like, are you on drugs? Like, she's trying to guess, you know what I mean? Is it is it your boyfriend? Is, yeah. Is she's trying to figure out what's going on. And, yeah. and she, she says to her, I was raped. So she's like, oh, my God, you know what I mean? Like, you know, let me get you help. Did you make a police report? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And she's like, no, because... There was somebody there, you know what yeah. I mean? And then your friend's like, What do I do with that information? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, and she it... stays at Cindy's for like a week. And then Cindy's husband starts to get like, Okay, come on, how long are they staying? How yeah, you yeah. stay in here, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a little different in the movie. It's funny, I guess, because of time constraints. In yes. the movie, yes, um, she goes to stay at her friend's house, mm -hmm. and uh, with the husband, you know, the her her friend <laughs> and her husband, and um, they're getting ready to leave to go out to dinner or something, and the the stuff immediately starts re. Um, raising hell in the house, breaking windows, ah. smashing plates, and they run back in and the the friend witnesses it and sees yeah, no. that, um, that she was telling the truth, that she wasn't doing this. And uh, um, she yells at her husband's no, she she tells her, we believe, I believe you now. I saw that, you know, so. Gotcha. Yeah, which is a powerful scene in the movie because um the relief is That's huge, right. uh, on, right. you know, that right, somebody because, finally believes her. Yes. The character, yeah. what's really great about the character in the book is she questions herself over and over. Like she does. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, and the, um, uh, well, maybe I like this movie more than I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, her name in the movie, uh, is Carla Moran. Mm -hmm. Is is that her real name? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no, her real name in real life. Yeah. No, it's uh, Doris Byther. That's right, Doris Byther. Yeah, in, in the movie, it's uh, Carla Moran or Moran. I can't remember. Yeah. But um, um, go ahead. Oh, so she leaves Cindy's after a week because the husband and and it shows like a very real argument in the bedroom, like. You know, Cindy's like, oh, come on, you know, like, what am I yeah. supposed to do? It's my friend. And he's like, what the, f what the hell is even going on with her? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's not like her house burned down. Like, what? Yeah. Um, so, and um, the main character hears that argument. So she makes it easy for Cindy the next day. And she's like, hey, you know, we're going to head back home. Thank you so much. You know, she kind of does that. So Cindy doesn't have to kick her out. <laughs> Yeah. And she tells Cindy, because Cindy's so worried. She's like, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? I know you're afraid to go back there. And she says, I'm going to go to my mother's in Pasadena. 
Yeah. And then we find out that her parents were wealthy. Oh, wow. She's from wealthy parents with rose gardens and shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, and um, um, wealthy parents who are also religious. Yeah. And that want her to be proper and, you know, the proper wealthy, whatever. Like, they want her to be, like, they want to be proud of her. Yeah. And um, it even talks about, like, how empty and dead her house is because her parents really probably want to be divorced, but they don't just because they have a daughter. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) So the house is, like dead yeah and um (laughs) and like even i guess because they're religious they're and i guess it's just a cold environment where nobody really talks or anything and even when she gets her period she doesn't know what's going on you know nobody's talking to her about any of this stuff and she like buries her bloody panties in the rose garden oh wow because she just like kind of I don't know, freaks out or like, oh God, you know, and then, and then shortly after that, um, she masturbates for the first time in her room and and describes it as as some kind of letting go detached kind of thing. Like, and, and then her mom finds her panties in the rose garden and then they, I don't know, they go through this whole thing of, I don't know, maybe like a really bad talk about the birds and the bees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like from yeah. really dead people that, yeah. you know, and she ends up being rebellious and course, liking her fucking parents. Exactly. And liking bad boys or older men or, yeah. and so she ends up um, hooking up with this older guy on a motorcycle that, yeah. um, that like hangs out at the high school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they go into that in the movie too. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. He, well, and that's don't... the husband. Yeah, that's who she ends up leaving with the sixteen. Yeah, in um, um, so they the go kid's into... father, I guess. Yeah, right, right, and um, they go into that briefly um, when the doctor is asking her questions to get her right. back up and out of her. Yeah, so they, they touch on all that. And... and then again, back to the real life account, according to the researcher, she didn't really share any information about her past. She was very kind of close-lipped about that, I think. So I don't know if any of that is factual. Oh, wow. It might just be made up from the guy writing the book, you know, <laughs> he had to yeah. give her a pass, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Eventually, what's ha- what happens is um, they, uh, the paranormal group, which is um, a university funded project uh, with loads of equipment and um, intelligent people involved um they set up a almost like a studio Mm -hmm. you know an apartment within like a gymnasium uh right where they can trap the entity so they have her uh go in and uh sleep almost like a sleep study and uh witness the phenomenon right which is really good part of the movie you know and uh um it's very in the very interesting part of the story and the movie was how this thing these entities um, would manifest you know these um um, sometimes it would be electricity and green lights. Yes. Yes. And, yes, and, and yeah, in the real case, there's photos you can look. Yeah, all the lights they captured. Yeah, which um, if you listen to future episodes, you'll know we're very interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but one of the um, 
one of the coolest things that they never hit on in the movie Mm -hmm. that um the son years later someone interviewed the son and he said yeah all that shit really happened you know and um right he um he said it happened so much they almost got used to it and he and one of the freakiest things he said was they'd just be sitting there the whole family watching tv right and that these fucking guys would just walk by the tv that's scary these human forms these silhouettes and it's like that scares me more than any of right. this other stuff you know <laughs> that is um, scary yeah they um you, you know it's funny it's funny what gets put into the movie but i would have loved to see that <laughs> yeah. But, yeah i guess they have to make choices right yeah like, they do so so the manifestations in the movie are all super intense uh, right you know which i understand but um yeah yeah um and do you want to talk about how we both think barry taft is a douche <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna leave that in. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and we'll even play a clip. Yeah. <laughs> There's a clip. Yeah. Um Yeah, he seems kind of full of himself. Yeah. Paranormal researchers can be assholes too. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, super interesting account, super interesting story. Um yeah. I can't remember. I think this is from the older Steiger book. And um, it's about um, masturbation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do you want to go first or me? So I'll go first. Okay. Okay. Real accounts. Yes. Shortly after I had completed work on my casebook about a out of body experience, the mind travelers was the name of the book. I was told this story by a man who recalled being quote cured of masturbatory practices when he slipped into an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. I was just 13. He told me, and I had been obtaining sexual release via self gratification for several months. <laughs> One time, this guy in the YMCA gave us a lecture about how masturbation will lead us to loss of strength, virility, when you really mm -hmm. needed it, and how it could even make you have a nervous breakdown <laughs> or go nuts if you did it often enough. You know, it was one of those old-fashioned scare the hell out of them, but don't bother to really explain anything types of talks. Mm -hmm. I figured the guy was just a holy Joe giving us a line. He was about 22 and we knew he was studying for the ministry. So I figured, you know, he just had to say things like that as part of his practicing for the pulpit. So anyway, that night I went to see this sexy movie without my folks knowing it. by today's standards. Of course, it was like the Bobsy twins nuzzling noses with Rebecca of Sunny, Sunny Book Farm. I, I don't even get those references. <laughs> <laughs> but everything is relative, you know, and it boiled my brains and my tender young testes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I went to my room as soon as I got home and headed right for the covers and lights out. I was fantasizing like hell and rubbing my penis for all it was worth. <laughs> Then I came and went at the same time. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I must have been the potency of that adole adolescent orgasm that just shot me right out of my body. Shit. I could feel myself floating up the ceiling like I was a crazy balloon on a string. Then I could look down and see myself lying still on the bed. I mean, I could see my backside. I had always wondered what I looked like from the back, and now I was able to see. <laughs> Jeez, I thought. Not only did I go insane, I died. Oh, my God. Then my body on the bed below gave a long sigh, took a deep breath, and I was back inside my body. I didn't masturbate again for years. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> All right, here's fun. About two years ago, at 11 o'clock one night, 
a Wisconsin co-ed was lying in her bed, drifting off to sleep. With some irritation, she became aware that something was pulling on her bedclothes, then tugging at her leg. She opened her eyes to see a hideous, hairy creature grinning lustfully at her and pulling her slowly across the bed. I was paralyzed, she told one of the author's correspondents. I could neither move nor cry out. There was no mistaking what plans the grotesque male creature had in mind for me. Then I thought very intensely, God save me. And there was a brilliant flash of light at the ceiling and the creature disappeared. I wore a cross for a long time after that. I thought that one was pretty crazy. That's like pretty a- good, yeah. I had a spirit lover when I was much younger, a female medium told this author in confidence. And I wish that I had never allowed it to come into me. You see, I can no longer be satisfied by a mortal man. (laughs) (laughs) Sexual intercourse with my spirit lover was beyond description. I have never achieved such orgasms with any man in the flesh. When I got married, you know, I was disappointed. (laughs) Sorry. Wow. (laughs) I tried not to blame my husband, but he just couldn't compare. You see, my spirit lover's penis could expand and enlarge itself until it filled my entire vagina, mm-hmm. almost to the point of pain. But oh, what pain. <laughs> <I'm sorry. Yeah. laughs> what delicious pain. And the act of intercourse could continue until I had come and come and was sexually satisfied to the point of exhaustion. With a mortal man, a woman gets one, maybe two or three chances a night to come. (laughs) If the man comes fast or is tired, you're out of luck. It's not that way at all with the spirit lover. He just keeps on and on until you're completely satisfied. But my advice to any young female medium is not to get started sexually with any spirit. It'll ruin your chance for happiness with any man on the earth plane. A spirit lover might be able to screw like Pan himself, but he can't keep you warm on cold nights or buy your groceries. (laughs) That's gold. (laughs) That's great. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that that I bet she's a very interesting person. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Who is that? I know. A male witch told me how he had deliberately set about conjuring up a succubus. I thought how groovy, quote, I thought how groovy it would be if I could have a luscious spirit chick whenever I wanted her. No fuss, no muss, like with a flesh and blood chick. I wouldn't really have to get involved with a spirit doll. He entered into an exhaustive regimen of incantations and conjuration and claims that he succeeded in summon, summoning a succubus that looked like Raquel Welch's big sister. <laughs> Jesus. Man, she would come some nights when I went through the rituals and we would make it like you would not believe, he said. She was nearly 1,500 years old and she had <laughs> learned every trick in the books. Maybe her body was kind of cold to the touch, but when I penetrated her vagina, it was like sticking my tool into molten lava. Damn. (laughs) Things ended rather badly for the witch and his cosmic concubine. He decided to go a bit kinky and set up some mirrors so he could have the added sensual pleasure of watching their myriad positions of love reflected again and again. I like like his stuff. (laughs) What he saw in the mirror that night nearly caused him to lose his mind. God, he moaned, clenching his teeth. I still nearly puke whenever I think of it. I was making it with the most god-awful kind of reptilian (laughs) creature right out of a wino's nightmare. And if it had taken me a long time to summon the beast, you will never guess what I went through getting rid of that toad woman. Wow. (laughs) Good. I love it. (laughs) 
in his book, Eros and Evil. Am I, do I have feedback? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. R.E.I. Masters tells of a young woman's bizarre encounter with a female medium with lesbian proclivities. The young woman had prevailed upon the medium for a private sitting after she had attended a number of group seances. The medium agreed after some hesitation, but made it clear that her young client would have to promise to meet all the stipulations. When the young woman arrived for her private sitting, she soon discovered that the first of the medium's conditions was that they should both be completely naked for the session. After they had stripped, they sat down in upholstered chairs and faced one another just a few feet apart. When they had entered the trance state, the young woman was startled to see a strange vapor issuing from the medium's vagina. A vapor that grew rapidly more solid, elongating and taking on a sinuous serpentine form. The young woman was frightened, but at the same time rooted in her chair by a powerful fascination. As she watched the phallic ectoplasmic mass approached her, as if mesmerized, she spread her thighs and permitted the thing to enter her own vagina. As the monstrous substance penetrated deep within her, the young woman felt an icy dread, but at the same time, a kind of unholy pleasure. Then the room began to spin and the young woman fainted, the ectoplasmic penis, icy cold like an icicle, lodged firmly in her vagina. When she regained consciousness, the medium, bending over her, attempting to force a nipple between the young man, woman's lips, the seeker of esoteric wisdom was no longer fascinated by the bizarre promise of the private sitting. She managed to extricate herself from the medium's embrace and grabbing her clothes from a closet she made her escape. Throughout this book, the author has attempted to demonstrate how Eros sex, denied, frustrated, and repressed, has precipitated the psychic dissociation responsible for alleged supernatural occurrences. This dissociation and mental fragment motivated by primitive ideas and desires generally derives its energy source from the erotic recesses of the soul and being the result of frustrated sexual and creative activity represents the destructive, the violent, and the perverse side of man's transcendent level of mind. The author has also hoped to establish that this dissociated mental fragment this projected bundle of repressions is a product of man's psyche, is thereby capable of ignoring the conventional barriers of time and space. It may behave as a child or an ignorant person and toss objects about the room and mash pieces of furniture. It may form other voices and other personalities. It may personify itself as a demon lover it may express itself in the grisly psychosis of vampire, werewolf, or ghoul. And we can't leave out details of witch confessions, which often speak of sex with the devil. First, we go to the Scottish witches, Isabel Gowdy and Janet Broadheed, their accounts. Isabel described the devil as a dark, hairy man, very cold. His cum was as cold as well water. <laughs> he had cloven feet and sometimes even appeared to her as a deer, the deer man. Oh, wow. And Janet Broadheed from the same era, the same place, also described the devil as big, dark, hairy, very cold. But he would visit her often and have sex with her. 
he visited he would visit her house while her husband was not there and oh. um and he would always give her he she said i think it said he would visit like every three weeks and that he would always give her a coin afterwards oh wow he, but that the coin would end up turning like red and it was like worth nothing. It was like fake. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? that <laughs> it's so funny. You uh, said that. Um, I was just reading that um, Cherokee little people book. Yes. And where they think that these uh, little people lived in Western North Carolina where they, well, where they found the tunnels and Mm -hmm. tons of evidence. This kid in the 1940s found a coin and it's, there's a picture of it in the book. It is fucking awesome. It's a, um, a coin and the whole coin. I mean, it's like a, a intricate piece of art. And right. the whole thing is a, like an elf and, you know, it, it it's so bizarre to find that in Western North Carolina, this right. is before, with, it's with pointy years. This is before Star Trek or anything like that. The, the, right. I, I, it just made me think when I read it, how cool and weird it was that it was a, the one artifact we have of of that is this coin supposedly you know that's crazy I mean, it's it's a total mystery that it, it, it but it um yeah i i don't know i like the symbology of the coin with uh mm. as like a um a token of like right yeah. uh, from the other side you know that type right. of thing it's like like here you go it wasn't a dream <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes that's... i didn't think about it that way yes yeah Cool. And be heading in that direction next episode, right? That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> they, and then I can't help but like this witch confession from England, 1645, Widow Mary Bush. She said the devil appeared to her in the shape of a young black man by her bed. And he had his way with her body. He was cold and heavy and could not perform well. Hmm. Uh, but she did deny God <laughs> and gave her blood. <laughs> and she said that after that, two creatures like mice would visit her on a regular basis and, and suck at her, I guess, her wound from the devil. Well, it, it, it's so bizarre. <laughs> Why couldn't he perform well? That bothers me. Like, well, uh, no, no, that makes me laugh because all the other, <laughs> all the most of the other accounts say that like it's an amazing lover, exactly. And then she's and she's like he didn't perform well, but she still renounced God. Yeah, <laughs> I always I laugh know. about Why? that. Like, okay, what, Mary, what, <laughs> wouldn't that turn you off? Wouldn't you say, "Well, this isn't for me"? And I... <laughs> he must have not been very devout. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, I I listened to. That. I, I'm sorry to. No, go. Okay, but um um that show we listened to I can't remember what was it UFO Chronicles, the new one? Yes. The the chick from North Carolina? Yes. It was so good and um um and she I, the thing that stood out for me from the experience was she was not a highly sexual person and, and even... yeah you think that because she kept saying like you know like i'm not into weird stuff like that yeah, or you know i would normally let anyone touch me there you know like she kept she making it like the best of her life yeah yeah she said it was amazing <laughs> she even thought about it afterwards like, accidentally yeah. like oh we're <laughs> yeah like oh no, oh no. Yeah. yeah that was pretty good Favorite movie of mine is Satanico Pandemonium, a Mexican mm-hmm. nunsploitation horror flick from, I think, <laughs> 1975. Um, awesome movie that I rewatched mm-hmm. for this episode. Um, the I did I- not watch it. It was, <laughs> <laughs> what, 
what language was it in? It was it's, like the subtitles were even yeah, in. Yeah, it's, it's in Mexican. Yes. It's in Spanish, and there's right. it's a, a Mexican film, and there is no version I know of that's dubbed in English. And okay. uh, uh, the DVD I has have is from a awesome company called Mondo Macabre, mm-hmm. and um, it's subtitled. And uh, right, but yes. yeah, um, really highly stylistic visual film mm-hmm. awesome occult imagery um, great movie but the movie opens up with a young nun picking flowers in this beautiful village and mm-hmm. her name's sister maria and there's uh a local village boy marcello and mm-hmm. they stop and have her friendly chat with each other you can tell there's uh Attraction. Well, no, no, he's kind of, he's, um, um, adolescent, probably around 13 or something. So there's not really an attraction there, but there's a, um, uh, definitely an adoration, mutual Mm -hmm. adoration. And, uh, you can tell this, the movie's focusing on her and, and, um, she's just a good, sweet nun, you know? Okay. So, um. Marcella walks away and all of a sudden there's this naked guy standing there Shit. holding an apple. <laughs> Interesting. And, okay. Yeah. Just boom, literally, literally appears. And, uh, she freaks out and, <laughs> and, uh, runs away back to the convent, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, you get back to the convent, you realize this isn't the best uh, life, a nun's life. You know, the nuns are cruel and okay. people are miserable. It's it's weird. They, they show that, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, so she's in her room at the convent and um, this naked guy appears again. And... Um, this really, really bothers her. Um, but he appears and re- and disappears and you can tell it upsets her. Um, so she starts to fantasize about him and you can tell she's really getting crazy horny. Okay. Visualizing him. And Mm -hmm. so she flagellates herself and she uh, puts like a crown of like, I don't know what you would call it, but a almost like barbed wire around her waist. Oh, okay. To punish herself. And, you know, it's bleeding and everything. And while, while she's got this contraption around her, she's whipping herself right across the back. And uh, I, I guess that was a, thing flagellation that you punishment you know for when right. you have sexual thoughts and uh which is probably most of why it was used you know it's like oh i can't think this i can't think this but anyway it's awful and um <laughs> oh. so um i i was just thinking of some of the crowley stuff where um, I don't know what it's from. I don't know which book. <clears throat> um, where kind of to train your mind. Yeah. You, um, like you uh, either cut, cut your yourself. Yeah. Okay. Go. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, kind I of remember. the same thing. Like, okay, I'm having bad thoughts. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, okay. Robert Anton Wilson was um, um, saying another way they would do it was to bite their tongue as hard as they could after right. like okay, yeah right. awful but um hey <laughs> whatever works go them. for it but uh, <laughs> the so while while all this is going on um a um a fellow sister a fellow nun comes into her room or knocks on her door and um mm-hmm. she covers herself at you know, to hide the scars right. and all that. And um, 
the nun comes in her room and seduces her. And, and shit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Here, yeah. this is how we handle this, sweetie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and she she resists, 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 and finally gives in. And mm. wouldn't you know it, the nun turns into this stranger, Uh-oh. this guy. <laughs> And he tells her, he said, I am Lucifer, I am Luzabel. He, he uses those names interchangeably, Lucifer and Luzabel. And mm-hmm. he says, if you need me, think of me. I'm with you your whole life. And okay. uh, then he disappears and her scars are healed and everything. So, Shit. yeah. So um, it's the next day we're back in the village Sister Maria's at the pond like the day before. And Marcelo, the kid, the boy, the village boy, is there fishing. And she comes up on him. And and this time, instead of a friendly conversation, she tries to seduce him. She starts kissing him and filling him up. And uh, he freaks out and runs away. (laughs) So... Like, what's wrong with the sister Mary? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, what a change. But, um, so she starts hallucinating. She sees serpents everywhere. Um, she, back at the convent, she tries to seduce another nun. Uh, mm-hmm. this nun rejects her and she fucking stabs her in the back, oh, kills her, then hides the body. <gasps> so she's really flipped out. Yeah, she got from- extreme. <laughs> Yeah, in in a short time, okay. she's gone from one to a hundred. But um, so yeah, she's she's out of her fucking mind at this point. So she goes to Marcelo's house, and <laughs> it's so <laughs> fucked up. This scene is so weird. She goes to Marcelo's house. His mom's like ninety years old, sitting oh, in a shit. chair. So you know, uh, crocheting. Right. And uh, she said, she tells his mom she needs to talk to Marcelo, and Marcelo's in bed sleeping. She gets naked, crawls in bed with him. Like, right, I guess, God. you know, the mom's not looking. Right, of course. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, he's a It's Sister Maria. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, yeah. So she, <laughs> she pretty much is raping him, okay. and he wakes up and, um, um, rejects her so she stabs him <gasps> then burns the fucking house down and goes Damn. back to the convent killing him and his mother you know and uh, it it's pretty wild it, you start seeing a lot of visual things and uh, you start seeing apples and black cats lots of symbolism right really really good symbol symbolism and I uh, so she's back at the convent and two nuns come to her room and tell her about Marcelo and the death and the fire. And, um, she pretends, Oh, this is, Oh, this is horrible. You know? And, uh, she realizes that she, that Marcelo had grabbed her necklace while this (gasps) was going on. So his corpse has her necklace in the hands. So she goes to where they're sto- they've stored the bodies at the convent and um, opens his casket and takes it back. Well, Mother Superior sees this God. and confronts her. <laughs> right. And um, um, she kills her. Yes, yeah, she, <laughs> she fucking strangles her and hides the body. And uh, um, so the next day, it's... Uh, the big funeral all the nuns are out um, at this extravagant outdoor funeral and the (laughs) the guilt of all the things she's done kind of hits her like an avalanche and she runs away to this she runs away from the funeral to a cave well Lucifer shows the stranger Lucifer shows up and tells her look if you accept me say you accept me um i'll make all this go away if not they're gonna torture you to death right you know and and he shows he gives her a vision of like inquisition style torture right and uh 
so the other nuns, she's sitting there thinking about it, and the other nuns come up on her. And she um, she thinks they're going to, st- they figured out what's going on and they're going to get her. Well, instead, they ask her to be the new mother superior. Oh, shit. <laughs> she says, okay. <gasps> they all go back to the convent. And they open the doors to, like, the cafeteria. Uh-huh. They're, all the nuns are naked. There's people <laughs> dancing. It's There's a like new a giant place. feast going on. <laughs> people, naked people are playing instruments. Uh, it's just a giant party. And Lucifer shows up and says, hey, you're the leader now. And uh, um, this, these are your people, you know. And uh, so she's into it for, for a little bit. Right. And then... I guess the guilt hits her again and she um as she's looking over um looking at this scene and all of a sudden one of the nuns comes up and stabs her in the back and Lucifer <gasps> smiles. <Yeah. laughs> and uh you see the shit eating grin on Lucifer's face, like, you know, this is my oh, work. And, yeah, so so she's stabbed she struggles back to her room and collapses uh-huh. and um fade to um three nuns showing up at her room at the door to her room and they're discussing oh how sad it is that maria has been so sick that she succumbed to the plague and finally died um what? yeah i'm probably <laughs> I'm probably not explaining this well. I've had way too much coffee, but what had happened? Was, <laughs> the whole movie was a hallucination. She That's what I'm thinking play. when you yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah, Sister That's Maria crazy. Had, was suffering from the plague and hallucinated the whole movie. And Mother wow. Superior is there and says how they'll plan her funeral, and then it cuts to Marcello and his mother walking by and paying their her, their respects. Wow. And the nun scene and uh the last scene is Lucifer walking by with an apple with his <laughs> with his eyes on another nun. <laughs> the plague continues. Yeah. <laughs> I I loved it. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it's a good movie. <laughs>